What is up, health enthusiasts? It's Coach Lambie here for Working Weights LLC, your guide to strength, health, and everything nutrition. I am joined today by my co-host, Dwayne Ulrich, aka Poppy Dwarl. Hey, and guys. Today, yeah, today we are going to be talking about seed oils and whether or not the latest research suggests that they are toxic. All right, Dwayne, how are you doing today? I'm doing good, man. I'm super excited about talking about seed oils. I know that sounds crazy, but uh, just, man, I've been hearing about th things about it, about, you know, uh, smoke point, and this oil is not good once past this particular temperature. And, uh, man, maybe it's just because we talked about it. Now I'm starting to hear, I just hear everybody saying stuff about it. So I, I, yeah. I, had, no, I, I had no idea it was a thing until you started telling me about it. Comes up, comes up more often once you hear about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, a little little personal news here. We got the AC system in yesterday. Mm. So that's that's nice because the temperature was starting to warm back up. I mean, it's not it's not uh, Texas, but you know, it was making it a little uncomfortable to sleep. But uh, made made you miss us though. You were thinking about it. Man, yeah, I wish I was yeah. in Houston, man. <laughs> we're back with my AC system. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yep. I took the uh, I took the guns out finally and shot them. The nineteen eleven and the uh, the twenty two. Yeah, how was it? So it was good. So uh, I bought a Rock Island Armory nineteen eleven from Dwayne, and then a uh, is, was a CZ a Ruger CZ. Yeah, CZ. CZ. Uh, twenty two caliber rifle. Man, and the 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 rifle is the most spot on shooting thing that I have ever shot. So I was picking off clay pigeons out the uh, uh, pit that we went to, and it's an uphill uh, kind of a deal. And but somebody had put clay pigeons out there, probably man, 150, 175 yards out there, and I was picking wow. those things off with the iron sights. <laughs> just no issues at all and that's the, awesome uh, man yeah the 1911 so i wasn't expecting too much because 1911s it doesn't matter how much you pay for them it's kind of a hit or miss uh kind of deal some of you know they they have issues jamming and they get dirty but uh i put a box of of rounds through it before it finally started to have some uh some grittiness in the action but it never jammed I, I put two two whole boxes through it and by the last like two magazines the uh, magazine would come back and eject the round but it wasn't going forward so i just have to slam it forward and then uh after i brought it home and took it apart to clean it i noticed that the uh the little plastic guide for the uh the spring that rides on the bottom of the barrel had actually started um to deteriorate so i actually don't think it was due to getting dirty it was probably just that that guide mm -hmm. um, so so the so guide are you talking about the guide rod not not so it's it's a it's a little plastic deal on the guide rod and oh it helps, yeah it helps everything slide along the barrel yeah 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 i just had a, a, a light go out <laughs> <laughs> well you still you still look good you still still look good yeah all right here so, we go we're doing doing it with a uh, with one light we could do we could drive it home with one headlight that's right that's right all right well let's get into this uh seed oil topic today um so you you said that since we talked about it last week we discussed what we were going to talk about this week and um as the audience on budsman i try not to give you too much information that I have before we do the podcast. That way you're hearing it kind of at the same time that the audience would be right. we're getting we're getting real reactions. So tell tell the audience um kind of what you have found about seed oils now that your your ears are tuned into it a little bit more. So uh just for everybody that's listening, I know pretty much squat about seed oils. And uh, the first time, first time uh, Coach Lambie mentioned something to me about it, it was like, said, and it said it real, spoke real fast. And I was like, what? Essential oils? And like, no, 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 no. We're not into essential oils. We're talking about seed oils. And so uh, as I started listening more and more, it's like, uh, 
I ran into a guy the other day and he, he had gone to a culinary institute and uh, uh, he was talking about, yeah, man, you shouldn't use this oil. You shouldn't use that oil because this smoke point is here. But when they get to certain temperatures, they become bad for you. And I have to be honest with you, he was so excited about the topic and he spoke so fast. I was literally like this. <laughs> I had no clue what he was talking about. Um, mm. And then uh, my son started talking about it as well. He cooks a lot. And he uh, he came in the other day with this jar of oil. And he was like so excited. saying, oh, I got this, but I paid this much for it. And I thought, it's cooking oil. He goes, no, no, no. It's it's avocado, man. It smoke points like 500 degrees. Okay. So I've been listening. And I kind of listen to people. Like I go to the grocery store. And I, every now and then you kind of catch other people and you're having a conversation. And I'm not a creeper. I'm not walking around going, oh, yeah, what are y'all talking about? I, it's not that. Just passing by, you know, in, in the food sections. And um, apparently people are becoming more and more conscious of, of what oil they use in cooking and eating, uh, salads, et cetera. And so with that said, I still know next to nothing. Next to nothing. All yeah. right. Well, we are, we're not going to talk too much about smoke points, but yeah, that, that definitely is a true thing. Different oils, different fats have different, um, different smoke points. So some of them are better for certain aspects of cooking. Um, so if you, if you're going to do stuff at real high temperatures, so like that avocado oil, you know, up to 500 degrees, um, I mean, that is some high temp cooking. So you know, if, if you need it, then that would be a good option. But, uh, I think as far as like cooking with it and smoke points, like most people just don't, don't do something high enough to really be that concerned about it. I think for the most part, uh, it comes down to taste and kind of what you're using it for. So whether you're going to fry fish. So like if I was to fry, fry up some fish in a pan, I don't like the taste of olive oil. Me neither. In that so yeah. I would use I would use something like a vegetable oil or a canola oil or something like maybe avocado oil even uh, because I think the taste is a little bit lighter for that application. But in in a salad or something, if I'm just going to put some some oil on a salad, it definitely is going to be olive oil. You know, yeah. just taste preferences for me. So. Yeah. But I think what we're going to talk about, I have a sense we're going to talk about, is like more like what what oil is more healthy for you and what are the fats in it. Yeah, we're going to we're going to get into um, uh, the health impacts of these seed oils. So seed oils is kind of um, this class of edible oils <clears throat> that there seems to be a lot of buzz about um, as far as the health impacts of these oils. And it, it mainly is coming from the um, the animal fat, the saturated fat. Um, the, the pro saturated fat proponents um, and saying that a lot of these oils that are seed oils and, and we'll get into the specific ex examples of them um, are uh, inflammatory. So they cause states of general inflammation and um, they're detrimental to your health. And what we're actually going to do is we're going to um, look at a blog article by a, uh, a company that's making a new type of oil, which I think is really, really cool what they're doing. Um, and so we'll get everybody to uh, look at the website and <clears throat> most of their um, website, however, seems to be um, kind of uh, dealing with this topic of the health issues of seed oils. Um, so we're gonna look at one blog article. And uh, like I said, we're gonna try and keep this podcast a little bit shorter today because our last two have been kind of long. So we're definitely going to look at two examples of uh, some references that they cite and maybe kind of, you know, skim through their article and see, um, teach people how to read a blog article um, and, and look for certain things. So this company <clears throat> is called uh, Zero Acre. And this is their blog. Let's actually go back to the shop because I want to talk about their oil for a second because, uh, this is pretty cool. So they are uh, uh, making a new oil, and it is not made the same way that we think about other oils, where we would take the seed or the fruit of some plant and 
squash it and, and do other kinds of stuff and extract the oil from it. So they are actually taking uh, sugar cane and fermenting it and whatever um, process they're they're using, so the microorganisms and stuff that are causing this fermentation action to happen, the the byproduct from that fermentation is actually an oil um, that is really really high in monounsaturated fat. So it it has a whole bunch of of healthy fat that is pretty much undisputed um, as being heart healthy for you. Um, now, their big claim is that it's low in the polyunsaturated fats, which is what we're going to discuss today, specifically linoleic acid. Um, but it also has a lower environmental impact in so much as that we already really produce a lot of sugar cane. And then the utilization of that sugar cane just to make plain sugar. And then what's left over is these husks and, and um, you know, the, the main plant part of it. So uh, I'm not exactly sure, but I think that they're, what they're using is that part of it. Um, so, so the impact on the environment is much, much less because they don't have to create new crops. We don't have to, to uh, cut and burn down, you know, rainforest um, to make more of this stuff. So if everybody can, I'd like you to come to Zero Acre and, um, you know, try and buy a bottle of this stuff. So I understand like that uh, 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 it's a little expensive right now, but it's because they have a very, very small production, they're very small scale. Um, and so when you're small scale and you're trying to produce things, the cost is a little bit higher. So the more that we can purchase from them um, and uh, allow them to expand production, then the, the more this cost will come down for everybody else. So give them a try, come check out their website. And uh, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm, really interested in this oil that they're making. We can see the, uh, the calories here. So it's about on par with other, other, um, cooking oils as far as calories go. And then, uh, you know, the fat, carbohydrate, protein, all that stuff. So, <clears throat> and it's in a, a, an aluminum bottle and I know they've done a lot of research, so you don't have to worry about the aluminum, um, leaking into that, leaching into that. And also it's, um, the oil inside is being protected from, UV light from the sun and UV light is something that breaks down oil over time and that's why you'll find a lot of cooking oil bottles are usually dark green or dark brown or something like that. It protects the uh, the oil from the from the UV rays. Well, I never so knew any of that. Yeah, yeah, kind of interesting, huh? That, that's that's why, amazing. Yeah, that's why you find really really old-timey bottles like from the um 1800s and stuff. You notice they're all yeah. brown? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, because they figured out a long time ago that the the sunlight actually degrades, you know, whatever you put in there, but if you were to put it in a dark colored bottle, glass bottle, um and it's not just oil, it's it's a lot of other food products, but if you put it in that dark glass bottle, that tends to filter out the UV rays and you you um, are able to preserve whatever you put in there a lot longer. Wow, look at me, I learned something. <clears throat> yeah, we're learning stuff. That's awesome. All right. So this blog oil is titled, Are Seed Oils Toxic? And the latest research suggests yes. So going off of the title of this blog article, we're getting the, um, the notion that the latest research suggests that seed oils are toxic. Okay, so one thing that I'm really, really going to be looking for out of this blog article is I want to see research that um, shows me the outcomes of toxicity. Would you agree? Yep, absolutely. Okay, yes. Yeah, so I want to see research that shows me consuming these oils results in symptoms of toxicity. And so now it, uh, you know, it may even be a good idea. Let's, let's um, find toxic. So toxic has uh, three definitions, and this is the American Heritage Dictionary. So one, of, relating to, or caused by a toxin or other poison. Two, capable of causing injury or death, especially by chemical means. Uh, poisonous, extremely risky, or harmful as a debt for which the borrower is in default. Uh, well, that one's not uh, applicable to us. So I think probably definition two is probably the one that is most applicable to us, capable of causing injury or death especially by chemical means or poisonous. Mm -hmm. So 
so I, I'm going to be looking for evidence that consuming seed oils results in injury or death, as that is the definition of toxic. Agreed? Agreed. All right. So let's get into this thing here. Uh, and then at the top here, we have the article at a glance, and this just kind of gives you the main breakdowns of the whole article. So here we have the introduction, and the introduction is going to talk a little bit about um, what seed oils are, how they've been used, and then a lot, a lot of the introduction here deals with um, the increase in consumption of, of uh, seed oils since they're... Um, What's the word? Inception? Inception. Absolutely. Yeah. Since, the, since their inception um, and then up until today or, well, whenever this was written, 2022. Okay. Um, and so how much seed oil we've been eating has nothing to do with um, whether or not they're toxic. Right? Yes. So a lot of a lot of blog articles that deal with this stuff where you get this introduction and it's kind of this lengthy history on something and it's not you know specifically addressing the claim made in the title this is we can just refer to this as storytelling so what they're doing right now is just kind of trying to set up a story um I I may even consider this as poisoning the well uh, because they're wow. trying to yeah, so, so you know, we can just quickly read through this. Uh, industrial seed oils. So already the, the word industrial. Why are they industrial? What makes them industrial? Mass produced. Would that be know. it? Other, Mass produced. We, we, we wouldn't say industrial ribeyes. <laughs> we, we wouldn't say industrial industrial breakfast cereals. So what specifically, I mean, I mean, butter, the butter section is just as big as the oil section of most grocery stores. So why isn't butter industrial butter? Industrial seed oils. Yeah. Okay. So also known as vegetable oils are in nearly everything. Uh, okay. If you use common cooking oils, eat prepackaged foods, or dine out at most restaurants, you're probably eating them every day. And you wouldn't be alone. Globally, vegetable oil production has increased more than 16-fold since 1909, has doubled in the last 20 years, and is expected to grow 30% in the next four years. And then they have some resources here, and I'm not going to click on those because all they're going to do is tell us about this um, uh, increase in production and the increase in consumption. The consumption of soybean oil alone has grown a thousand fold since 1909. So again, none of this has anything to do with the health impacts or the level of toxicity of these oils, right? They're just trying to um, um, tell a story. They're just trying to set up a story here. So perhaps it's not a coincidence that increased vegetable oil consumption correlates with higher rates of obesity, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, and other modern health problems. Mm, so that's a claim. And we don't actually have any references here for it. They have links under the words obesity and heart disease. And if I click on those, I'm sure that they're just going to give us... Uh, yeah, so this links us to another one of their blogs, uh, which we're not going to go into. Heart disease. Seed oils is a driver of heart disease. Uh, is this a white paper? So this is actually, I think... I have read this one. Let me scroll down here. Let me scroll down here. So they have pretty lengthy um, blog articles, and they, they put in a lot of resources. Ah, here we go. Okay. So this, this is a chart from the CDC, okay, and um, uh, our green line is age-adjusted death rate. The blue line is total polyunsaturated fatty acids per capita, and the red line is cigarette use. And so what we see here for the green line is age-adjusted death rate is going up, 
and this is going to be um, due to heart disease, right? And then we can see this kind of peak around 1964, between 1964 and 1968, and then we see it coming back down. So already we have a contradiction, right, yep. within their own website. Right. So in this article on whether or not they're toxic, they're saying that the increased consumption of vegetable oil correlates with higher rates of, we're not going to talk about the obesity, but heart disease. And then in their own paper, they show a chart from the CDC showing that heart disease has been declining for the last 50 years. So there's an issue here, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Uh, with so much evidence pointing to the harmful effects of seed oils, now see, we haven't even um, we haven't even gotten in, into anything. They've already uh, uh, they've already this is poisoning the well. So they've already made the claim here um, with so much evidence pointing to the harmful. Well, what evidence? They haven't shown us anything yet in this article, right? Yes, I agree. So we have um, we have a line here on kind of what um, seed oils are known as. They're used in cooking, they're used in prepackaged foods, they're used at restaurants, consumption has gone, gone up, and predict, um, the predicted, uh, uh, what is the word? Production, predicted production is expected to increase. There hasn't been any evidence to point to harmful effects of this yet, okay? Uh, many have described them as toxic, right? Well, who are those many? But do seed oils meet the definition of toxicity? So that's, yeah, kind of what we want to know. Uh, in the hundred years since they first entered our diets, um, plenty of scientific findings suggest that seed oils have toxic effects on cells, animals, and humans. Abundant evidence also just suggests they're likely unsafe for long-term consumption in quantities most people eat today. All right, so... Um, they haven't given us any any evidence yet, but they're already making the claim. So this is storytelling. It's also poisoning the whale. They're poisoning the well, um, and so th what they're trying to do is already give you the preconceived notion that there's this vast amount of evidence that suggests that that exists that suggests that these things are toxic. Um, I'm wondering when I'm wondering when they're going to start drawing all this together because Zero Acre makes cooking oils, right? Zero makes cooking oils, yeah. So yeah, so I'm trying like, okay, where are they going? Where are they going with that? Because the yeah. data they're showing is just really is like, I don't want to use the word circumstantial, but uh, I mean it's just historic. You know, the the graph, the red line showing, uh, you know, heart disease. That's 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 that's, that's study wide. That's that's just medicine wide, you know, yeah, the, heart, the, heart, heart, heart disease and it's coming back down and it's like, well, what are you going to throw up there and say, oh, that's all because of cooking oils. Uh, I don't know what they're trying to tell me, you know, that's crazy. All right. Yeah. So the, the red line um, is actually cigarette use. So this graph is showing that cigarette use kind of peaked around the same time heart disease was peaking. And the blue line way down here at the bottom is uh, polyunsaturated fat consumption. Now, right. judging by this graph, like, I don't really see a correlation between heart disease, deaths from heart disease, and polyunsaturated fat intake. I don't either. These, Does... these two lines don't look very similar at all. And yeah. this graph shows us that despite the increase in polyunsaturated fat consumption, heart disease has gone down. Correct. De I agree. Deaths from heart disease has gone down. Right. So, um, yeah, so that's it. All right. So the next part of this blog, seed oils and vegetable oils, what are they? So they're going to kind of define what these things are broadly, and they're going to give us some specific examples. So seed oils are um, canola, corn, cottonseed, soy, rice bran, grape seed, safflower, sunflower. I think there's a few other, but these are the ones that they mention. And then they have some other oils. So olive, palm, coconut, and avocado, those would um, technically be considered fruit. <clears throat> and so that's what separates those oils from the seed oils. Uh, and so here's the most common examples. And again, you know, it's just the same, 
Same thing. So not only is seed oil consumption at such a massive scale uh, new to the human diet, but all of these oils are also high in omega-6 polyunsaturated facet, fatty acid called linoleic acid. Uh, and they do have an asterisk here, but more than likely that's just going to um, lead us to an article that tells us that, you know, omega-6 fatty acid is linoleic acid. Uh, so this next sentence here is the one we're going to focus a lot on today. And if we get um, farther than that, then good. If not, we won't. So okay. omega-6 fats, while necessary in extremely small amounts, contribute to general inflammation and other health issues when eaten in excess. That's why many of the health impacts of seed oil consumption are similar despite varying types of seed oils in different diets. And then they give us two references here, which we're going to look at now. <clears throat> This um, this first sentence here, actually both sentences, are what we might call a false equivalence because it's stating that omega-6 fats, or we can rephrase this, so seed oils containing uh, linoleic omega-6 fat, while necessary in extremely small amounts, contribute to general inflammation and other health issues when eaten in excess. Now, the phrase, while necessary in extremely small amounts, can apply to any food that we eat, right? If yep. we're just talking about preventing deficiency, so any right. macronutrient or micronutrient, if we're just talking about preventing deficiency, well, they're all necessary in extremely small amounts. Right, right, right. right. It's, not, it's not necessary to consume large amounts of any. Right, right. Agreed. Uh, and then the uh, third part of that statement, contribute to general inflammation and other health issues when eaten in excess. Now, I would like to know if anyone can name to me something, a food source, a macronutrient or a micronutrient that does not contribute to general inflammation or other health issues when eaten in excess. So the defining um, term in this uh, statement here is when eaten in excess, right? So if, <laughs> if, I'm yes, trying so, hard. I was trying like, well, that was a challenge. I'm trying to think of it. It's like, if no, you eat anything in anything. excess, it's going to cause health issues. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. And if you eat it to excess, more than likely it's going to cause you to gain weight and weight uh, increased adipose tissue will increase general inflammation. Fat yes. tissue in your body is a pro-inflammatory tissue. Yes. So, yes. so we can literally change this sentence to any food substance in the world. In fact, you brought up the fact that they make an oil. So logically, if this statement's hold true, and anything eaten in excess will cause health issues and general inflammation. And I don't think that anyone is going to be able to give me an example of something that does not, right? We can replace this omega-6 fats with anything we want. So zero acre bakers and oil, so we can replace omega-6 fats in here with zero acre oil. Zero acre oil, which contains whatever monounsaturated fats, while necessary in extremely small amounts, contribute to general inflammation and other health issues when eaten in excess. So this sentence can apply to anything. So as we can see here again, on the face of a lot of these sentences, at first glance, you first read it, you might not realize, um, you know, kind of the story that they're trying to set you up for so that it's, it's easier to um, believe the evidence that they're going to give you, right? Right. But most of this, you know, so we already see that there's a contradiction within their own website on the rates of heart disease and, and the, uh, uh, the correlation between polyunsaturated fat intake and the rate of heart disease or, or heart disease deaths. Um, and then we have a logical fallacy here uh, in this sentence um, about eating things to, to excess. Okay. Yeah, I want to like their product, but... Uh... <clears throat> Right now, they're not doing themselves a lot of favors, just saying. Yeah. Well, you know, I think two things can be true at the same time. They can have a great product, and they can be wrong on this. That's true. That's true, and I'm, I'm hoping for that. Yeah. All right. So we're going to get into these two um, references that they cite here, and um, uh, I'm going to click on this so we can just see. So I want you to see the title here. 
influence of N6, which is omega-6 versus omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids in diets low in saturated fatty acids on plasma lipoproteins and hemostatic factors. Um, so I've already gone through this article. <clears throat> All right, so let's get into this study and let's see what this study says and whether or not it supports their claims. So the claims here, so first of all, we're going to go back to the title, okay? So the latest research suggests that seed oils are toxic. So, Dwayne, I'm going to ask you, this article is written in 2022. What, how many years within the year 2022 would you consider to be the latest research? Uh, so you mean within 2022? So, so starting from 2022, so if I'm going to make a claim that the latest research shows something, it would have to be within a certain. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just, I would just say three to five years tops that they're putting it out in 2022. But I mean, you have to look at, you have to look at 10, 20 years to, to get, you know, uh, you know, good studies, but yeah, it couldn't be more than a couple of years. Three to five. Okay. Yeah, easy. So let's uh, let's take a look at when this study was was uh, published. Nineteen ninety seven. Hmm. That's their so, that's their latest. Right. That's so does their this, latest. Wow. Does does this study fit the the what the this description of the title? The claim of the title. The latest research. So does this fit the description of the latest research? I would I don't, say. No. I, I would. I don't think so at all. Yeah, I'm. I'm in agreement with you. Three to five years. I'm going to say five years would be the cutoff point. Right. Um, so that would be 2017. So 2017 would be the cutoff point in saying the latest research. Uh, all right. So this is not the latest research, but let's go through it uh, sometime. Uh, let me see where am I at? Okay. So uh, in the uh, in the beginning here, it gives um, a little bit of background about dietary um, fats and um, a little bit of description on how some of the um, previous research prior to this paper has shown uh, some inflammation and uh, some negative outcomes from um, omega-6 fats, okay? So... Let's see, let's move on to the next page. And I've never used this before here, but... All right, so on this page, uh, so what we have is this uh, study is looking at 27 healthy non-obese males age 18 to 34. And, you know, going back to last week from our sodium podcast, a lot of studies are recruiting college age um, males who are going to college because they will do studies for very little, little money, right? There's not a lot of money that's put into nutrition um, altogether. And so you don't have a lot of money to pay participants. And so that's why we see very small participant sizes. And um, you'll notice that lots and lots of participants are college aged and they're usually recruited from colleges. So these participants are recruited from King's College London and in the beginning, they went ahead and took a whole bunch of um, uh, measurements. So just like you would go to the doctor and have your blood drawn and have labs done, that's what they did here. And so we're going to be looking at some specific markers, so plasma cholesterol, so total cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, HDL cholesterol, triglycerides, um, white cell counts, fibrinogen, this factor V2C, um, I think it's V2C, it may be VLLC, I'm not really sure, uh, and platelet count. And so these are kind of going to be the ones that we're going to be focused on the most <clears throat> because everything else here is dietary intake um, and just kind of the amount of certain macronutrient stuff that they were eating. All right. Uh, so what they did is they set up three... Um, three different diets. Let me see if I can. I'm just going to say while you're looking for that is as the common man ombudsman, I'm already like, they picked 27 guys. Seriously. Look, you can't get 27 chickens and get a good idea of what kind of eggs they're going to make. You know, it's yeah. like, holy yes. cow. So they, they feel, so when you have these um, RCTs with very, very small sample sizes, 
one of the issues with small sample sizes is that it is a small sample size. And so the results can, can very, very easily be skewed by one or two hyper responders that go in either direction. Right? Yes, yes. So larger participant sizes are kind of um, what you would want. But like I said, there's not a lot of money that goes into nutrition research. And so oftentimes we'll see these very small sample sizes. And it just is what it is. That's what yeah. they had to work with, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you, okay. can't, you can't fault them for that. They but were in they, London they, too, by the way. King's College yeah, in London. London. <clears throat> so, yeah. But they, they felt that um, – uh, it's in here somewhere. They felt that um, uh, a certain number of participants would allow them to show um, a good enough uh, difference between things so that they could draw statistical significance. So, okay. I'll give them, I'll give them the benefit of the doubt. You know, it is Let's what it is. <laughs> so what they did here is they created three diets. They had a run-in on the saturated fat diet, okay? And then they had a high omega-6 diet, or a diet that was um, omega-6 and omega-3. They added omega-3s to it. And so what they did, everybody did this run-in diet on the saturated fat, and then they were randomized to either the omega-6 or the omega-3, and they did that uh, for, for three weeks. And then they had an eight-week washout period, and then they came back and they did the diet that they did not do before. So they came in, did a saturated fat diet, um, if you got randomized to the omega-6 diet, you did the omega-6 diet for three weeks. Then you had an eight-week washout. You came back, you did the omega-3 diet. Make sense? Yes. Um, yes. Okay. Yeah. So this is called a crossover design. And it's really, really – this is a really good design um, when we want to look at um, the effects of certain nutrients or foods because you're looking at the effects on the same person, right, rather than if we just had the two groups – Right, right. One one person could, right. you know, have different effects from um, either one. And so, you know, there's places for everything. But crossover design is really, really good for this type of thing. So what did the saturated fat diet consist of? Uh, most of the fat came from butter. Major and, fat was olive oil in the in six diet, right? Yeah, I'm reading that yep. right there. So, so yeah, yeah. yeah, so just just above olive oil to the right, you'll see in yellow is butter. Right. Okay. The N6, the omega-6 diet was olive oil, and then the N3 diet was a mixture of olive oil and fish oil. Now, we have to go back to the title and find out if this study supports the claims being made. So the latest research, which we've already determined this does not count as the latest research, suggests that seed oils are toxic. And they gave a description, they gave some examples of seed oils, what was seed oils and what were not seed oils. Olive oil was considered not to be a seed oil. So this study does not even include the oils that they are considering to be toxic. Wow. Correct? Yeah, just, yeah, I'm, I'm reading that right now. Right. Wow. So the, the inference is going to come in that olive oil does contain linoleic acid, right? So the kind of the main thing here is the omega-6 fat, that um, linoleic acid. So, all right, that's fine. Uh, so let's look and see if linoleic acid did anything, okay? All right, so we're going to look at this chart at the top here. And now what I've done for this chart, so again, we're looking at some of those um, markers that we looked at from the top. So before everybody came in, they did a blood test and they ran some labs and they looked at cholesterol and some other stuff, right? And so then post diets, they did the same thing. They draw some blood and they ran some labs. And so we're going to look at the differences between these diets and we're going to see how much of a change um, there was here. And so uh, if we were to go back to the first page, we would see that in the abstract, um, I think they show that uh, the omega-6 diet had increases, increased levels of um, uh, fibrinogen and the V2 or V2A, VLLA, I'm not sure what that is. So we're going to look at all this stuff and, and see what all this means. So for total cholesterol, our saturated fat diet, we, uh, we actually saw an increase in total cholesterol on that diet, right? 
Um, let me see if I can go back to page one so we can get a good, uh, So page two. All right. So plasma cholesterol, they're in millimoles uh, because this is, is uh, European and for America, we would have this in milligrams per deciliter. But all right. So total cholesterol was 4.1. LDL cholesterol was 2.44. Plasma HDL 1.3. All right, so 4.1 was the initial, so we see an increase in total cholesterol in the saturated fat diet. For the N6 and the N3 diet, we see decreases in total cholesterol. Okay, um, decreases in total cholesterol are associated with, with greater health outcomes. LDL cholesterol, we saw there's a small bump up in LDL cholesterol in the saturated fat diet, and then a small decrease in both the N6 and the N3 diet, and... Um, you know, we could just look at some other things here. Uh, so I have these orange uh, markers because those are kind of the main things that we would look at if we were going to be determining health outcomes, right? Whether or not these uh, uh, omega-6 linoleic acid um, contributes to health, uh, um, deterioration of health, right? So our orange markers here uh, are total cholesterol, and our LDL cholesterol, those would be things we'd be looking at. And our fibrinogen, we're going to get into that one. So 4.1, 2.44. We'll go back to our other study. And we see that those decreased on this diet. So we would consider that to be an improvement in health markers. Yeah, I agree. Right? Yeah, I yeah. agree. We can also notice here, I've highlighted in blue yep. the things that are not different. And they're also denoted by these asterisks. So we can see that for total cholesterol and LDL cholesterol, between the N6 and the N3 diet, they're not statistically yeah. significant from it, right. from different from each other. Right. 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 Uh, when we go down to the HDL, we can see that between the saturated fat diet, and one of the uh, main claims to saturated fat diet is you'll have an increase in HDL. We can see that between the HDL and the omega-6 diet, there's no difference between those two. Moving all the way <clears> through, <throat> um, you know, all the HDLs, there's different kinds of HDLs, which we're not concerned with uh, very much. But we'll move down to total triglycerides. We can see triglycerides between the saturated fat and the omega-6 diet are not different. We can see that um, the plasma alpha tocopherol per cholesterol uh, is slightly lower in the omega-6 diet than the uh, saturated fat and the omega-3 diet. Those two are not different from each other, but we have a 0.4 difference from the omega-6 diet. And whether or not that's good or bad, I don't know. Okay, I couldn't find a whole lot of information on this ratio, this alpha to cholesterol to cholesterol ratio. But, you know, for what it is, uh, it is different from the other two. However, it is not denoted by an asterisk. So the authors have concluded it is not statistically significant. It's not a huge in, difference. In their difference, yeah. And then we get into some other markers. So apolipoprotein. So ApoB, this is um, just kind of like the LDL. So this would be a total particle count. ApoB are the atherogenically potential um, lipoproteins. So these are um, – so the best marker for your risk factor as far as your cholesterol would go would be to get an ApoB count. And we can see here that between the omega-6 and the omega-3 diet, they are not statistically significant. And the highest level of ApoB was in the saturated fat diet. And that kind of goes uh, all the way down. We have ApoA1 um, and ApoA2. Those are um, more uh, HDL. And we can just, you know, you can look at those and see for yourself there. And then we have LP little a, and this is another one of those um, atherogenic potentially um, particles. And we can see that all three of the diets were different from one another, with the omega-3 diet actually being the highest, and the saturated fat diet being the lowest, and the omega-6 diet being in the middle. What I've also done here, so I've highlighted in blue the differences, so we can see there's a whole lot of blue on this chart, right? So the omega-6 mm -hmm. diet really isn't very different from either of these other two diets regarding a lot of the markers. I agree. I've underlined in red 
Now, we have to go back to thinking this is the same kind of um, lab that you would get when you go to the doctor's office. They would draw your blood, they would send it out to the labs, and you would get a report back. So we're not just going to be looking at changes from baseline. We also want to know whether or not these levels are within the reference range. Because if, so it can change, right? The level can change from baseline to post-intervention to post-diet. But if it hasn't changed within the reference range, our category of risk has not changed. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. Okay. So just because... To me, it makes sense. Yeah. So just because we can show that there's a statistically significant uh, change from baseline to post-intervention or between diets doesn't mean that our risk category has changed. Okay. So we want, to, we want to see, in order for this study to say that linoleic acid contributes to um, poor health outcomes, we should see these markers move outside of the reference range. Agreed? You follow? Uh, absolutely. I'm with you. I'm with okay. you. So going back to this chart here, on the left in red, I have included the reference ranges for some of these markers. Some of them I couldn't find reference ranges for, and that's fine, but we're going to look at the ones that are kind of most important. So for total cholesterol, the normal reference range is less than five. Right. And we can see that all three diets are within the normal reference range. So all three diets are in the same risk category as far as total cholesterol. As far as LDL cholesterol, the reference range is 2.6. The saturated fat diet is right there at the cutoff but all three diets are within the reference range. So all three diets are in the same category of risk as far as LDL is concerned. Uh, for HDL, it's greater than one, and we can see that all three diets are in the same category. As a matter of fact, all three diets aren't even that different from one another. For triglycerides, we're looking at less than 1.7. We can see all three diets are well below the reference range in that. So all three of those diets are within the same ca risk category. Apolipoprotein B, the category, the uh, the reference range is 660 to 1330, and all of these, all three of these diets are within the 500s, right? The mid 500s to the low 500s, with the saturated fat dying being the highest. However, they're all in the same risk category. All of these and are in L the same risk category. They're they're all underneath. Yeah. LP none of this is out a, of the range. Yeah. None of it is out of the range. So if you were to um, go to your doctor and have your blood drawn and we were to look at three different labs and and these were the three what your doctor would most likely tell you now i am saying most likely because i am not a doctor and this is not medical advice but your doctor would look at these three labs and say there's no change happening here yeah right yes yeah. yeah, in fact he okay. probably said he probably sends you home and go hey you're doing great looking good yeah. All right. So we're going to move down to the graph on the bottom of this page. Uh, and this has some markers. A lot of these are um, involved in blood clotting. Um, and so some of them, so like the factor uh, V22C, oh, I think I was saying A before, it's V22C, uh, or V2C or VLLC. I'm not really sure which one it is. Um, so, so that one is... Uh, is associated with inflammation. Fibrinogen is also associated with inflammation. And then white blood cell counts, way down at the bottom, platelets and white blood cell counts are, are associated with inflammation. So let's discuss this graph at the bottom. So again, we can see there's a big field of blue, right? Yeah. There's not a lot of difference between these three diets happening. Some of them are statistically different from the others. But there's not a lot. There is a lot of blue happening on this thing. So as far as the reference ranges go, for the factor V2 antigen, reference range is 65 to 140. All three diets are within the reference range. Factor V2C activity, reference range is 50 to 150. All three diets are within the reference range. Fibrinogen, the reference range is 200 to 400. 
all three diets are within the reference range. Now, I actually looked up, um, so that is the, the normal reference range, and they have actually come out with a new reference range that is the optimal, and that is 100 to 300. And we can see that all three of these mm. diets produce a fibrinogen level that is in the optimal range. Okay. Fibrinogen and is a protein, isn't it? It's a protein. I believe it is, yes. Yeah, for and clotting. It's, it's, it's involved in the blood clotting process, and so the type of inflammation that we associate fibrinogen with um, is the good kind of inflammation, so repairs. Repairs. So when we have, when we have repair happening in the body, we would see inflammation go up, and that's, that's not a bad thing. So if fibrinogen, I think the, the, um, the range where we would say that um, you are in a detrimental risk category, you in a high risk category, is above 700. Wow. For wow. fibrinogen. And so see, even, see, even with the new criteria, these are all, all the fibrinogens all in, this is in the good area. They're in the optimal range. Yes, right? optimal range. Yeah. So for platelets and white blood cells, now if platelet and white blood cell counts are high, we would um, associate that with general inflammation. So that would be associated with something like rheumatoid arthritis mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. and, and some other um, autoimmune disorders. Also, if they're really, really low, so in the low, below the, the normal um, reference range, we could associate that with some other types of autoimmune disorders. Um, but let's take a look here. So platelet count, the reference range is 150 to 400. And we can see that all three of those diets are within the reference range. And the white blood cell count is 4.5 to 11. And all three of those diets, they're not even statistically different from one another, and they're well within the reference range for that. All right. So, Dwayne. Yes. As the audience ombudsman, tell me your thoughts on that study. Uh, I didn't really see a whole lot that was extraordinary. Everything that we looked at was within the accepted um, ranges. Or, or even below. And I don't think that, um, I really didn't see huge, huge changes or remarkable changes from the difference of any of those three diets for that study. Um, I like the study. I like the, the fact that um, <clears throat> you know, it was done in three phases and uh, I can agree, although I like to see a study that's got a lot more um, data sources, but the way the study was done, I think it's uh, indicative. And uh, while there are some, while there are some changes in the data, none of it was like extraordinary. So the difference between N6 and N3 were like not super extraordinary to me. So that's yeah. what I got. So that's what I got. I don't really know what to. I I really need to think a little bit more on it to make come up with some kind of magnificent you know, revelation, but I, I don't really have one. Um, so let me ask you this. Does it support the notion that the latest research suggests seed oils, which consist of canola, corn, cotton, grapeseed, peanut, rice, safflower, soybean, and sunflower oils are toxic? No, not at all. Do, does it support the claim that omega-6 fats, linoleic acid, specifically contribute to general inflammation. So remember, our fibrinogen, our platelet counts, and our white blood cell counts would, would be the uh, markers associated with inflammation in that study. No, I don't believe so. I believe everything was in, this, is in optimal range. So no, I don't believe it. I, I, I don't think so. It, to me, it, doesn't, it wasn't a remarkable increase in, in inflammation, no. Do you, do you believe that it supports the claim that omega-6 linoleic acid contributes to health issues? Yeah, you know, if you drank a cup, a, a truckload of it, you know, a couple of days a week, yeah, it would, but no. From, from, from the results from this study, you would say no, correct? I would say no. Yeah. But that's, so, and, and, and I'm not a nutritionist, so I, I don't think that's not rocket science. Just look but at just, the numbers. Yeah, just showing you what the numbers are and that they were all within reference range. Now, one mm. thing that I wanted to um, point out in this study, and um, uh, we are getting kind of long here, so I don't think we're going to go very much into the next study, is that we saw fibrinogen increase 
and our total cholesterol and our LDL cholesterol decreased, right? So fibrinogen Ooh. did increase on that omega-6 diet from baseline. However, it was within the, within the reference range. So in this study, um, this was looking at a uh, difference in soy oil capsules. Um, and this was, this was also a good study in soy actually being one of those seed oils. So this study actually did look at it. I think this study was done in 2017, so it did fit the, co the uh, category of the latest research. However, on the low omega-6 diet, what they experienced was an increase in fibrinogen and a decrease in total cholesterol and LDL cholesterol. And the right. authors make a note here. There was an increase in fibrinogen and uh, um, C-reactive protein within the normal range in the low linoleic acid group. So in the low linoleic acid group in this study, fibrinogen increased also C-reactive protein, which is a direct marker of general inflammation. So general inflammation went up on the low linoleic acid diet. Despite significant reductions in LDL and total cholesterol, these findings may indicate a transient phenomenon present during the transition from normal linoleic acid intake to low linoleic acid intake. And then they go on to talk about another study that observed the same thing, and the results from that study actually are beneficial from the consumption of seed oils, but we won't get into that. So there, the authors in this study are saying, hey, we saw this increase in fibrinogen um, even though total cholesterol and LDL cholesterol dropped and, you know, that could just be due to a transient, that just could be a transient phenomenon due to this change in diet. So the authors from this study, right, what we saw in the other one was our omega-6, our linoleic acid diet had the same thing, increase in fibrinogen, decrease in total cholesterol and LDL cholesterol. And the authors from this second study that is is cited in the blog article basically invalidate the findings of the increase in fibrinogen to a transient phenomenon. All so I can say all I can say is yes, I understand that. Uh, I get it. The transient phenomenon that that line is very important so that um, they don't believe it to be a the norm. Yeah, in other words, saying, yeah, saying, that's not hey, normal. If this, if, if this went on for a little longer, we would probably see that fibrinogen level drop. And they right. they don't cite any evidence as to why that could be. So they're, they are purely running on speculation here. So mm -hmm. just like with our sentence where we replaced omega-6 fat with zero-acre seed oil, right. we can replace the low linoleic acid group in this claim with our omega-6 group from the other study, and the statement would still hold true. Right. I right? agree. Yep, yep, yep. Yep. True. And then uh, uh, our bottom uh, highlighted in red here, this is important. The fat intake in the medium linoleic uh, uh, dietary group is typical for the Korean population, but much lower than that in Western countries. Thus, the results of this study cannot be generalized to other populations with a higher fat intake. Furthermore, it should be noted that the role in LPPLA2 is still controversial. This this study looked at that um, LPPLA2, but all, again, it was like I just we will go to that just because we got there. So, but anyway, the authors in this study are saying, hey, um, you know, this study was done specifically with the dietary fat range of Koreans mm -hmm. and is not applicable to other to to general. Um, you know, to be used for general um, populations. Populations. How and and yet, what we find is it being cited in this blog article for general populations. That's crazy. That's crazy. This, just this, just despite the author saying, "Don't use this in that way." So, uh, yeah, I want to look at this PLA uh, LP PLA two activity because this study I actually saw was referenced by uh, Paul Saladino, and he was having a, a, maybe not a debate, but is a discussion with um, a cardiologist on YouTube. And he actually referenced this study and said, hey, this study uh, shows negative outcomes. Uh, so this LP PLA two activity, um, we do see that, uh, so we had three diets here, low linoleic acid, medium, and high, and we do see an increase uh, in that LP PLA two activity. But again, 
What are the reference ranges? So the reference range for LPPLA2 is less than 200 millimole. That's the normal range. And the optimal range is less than 123. And we're looking at a level of like 15 and a half, 15.75. So 15 and a half out of 123. Does this study really show negative outcomes? No, so. no. It, honestly, this study to me was like, okay, why are we even talking about it? Because it's not, not us, but why would they be really considering it? Because it's not significant at all. Yeah. So, okay. We are going a little bit long. So I think that's all we're going to do for this blog article. But I think that, um, I think we've done a pretty good job of showing that I think, I don't think that they did a good job of uh, stating their case. You know, just as far as we got within that article, there's much, much more article. But uh, within that article, we had some storytelling. We had some claims being made early on without any yeah. evidence. Yeah. We had a, a contradiction yeah. within their own website. So they claimed um, heart disease was on the rise. And then they actually provided a graph in a different article that shows heart disease is declining despite the increase in, in PUFA. And then we showed um, logical fallacy within a statement where they're claiming, hey, if you overconsume omega-6, it's going to contribute to this. Well, overconsumption of anything contributes to those things. And then we also showed that the references they cited don't actually support the claims they made. And I will I'll, I'll also add this. That as far as the um, contributes to general inflammation goes, those two studies actually uh, refute that claim. Those two studies studies show uh, reductions. You know, the second study actually showed a reduction in CRP when we increase linoleic acid, and then the first study, um, you know, there was a small increase in fibrinogen. However, it's within the optimal range. Uh, right. And also, you're going to have to prove to me that that small increase is a bad thing because fibrinogen is associated with, um, you know, good types of inflammation. So right, right, right. I, I, so so I, I didn't mean to cut you off, but so I have a question. So seed oils or other oils? What, what can, we, can we can we generalize like, OK, seed oils? Can, are typically better than, say, uh, I don't know, olive oil or avocado oil. Uh, did I throw you a curveball? No, not really. Is, so is there I, I do, is there a significant difference? Is there a significant difference? So between what we would call, um, so we have saturated fatty acids and we have polyunsaturated fatty acids and right. monounsaturated fatty acids. Right. And so what we're kind of looking at is in terms of the difference in foods is we're looking at fats that are solid at room temperature versus uh, solid uh, fats that are, are liquid at room temperature. And so we can just refer to these as liquid oils and then the other things are going to be solid oils. Solid. Right? So butter, coconut oil, palm oil. Things of those nature are going to be solid, butter, ghee, um, that type of stuff, tallow. And then our liquid temp, uh, oils are going to be mostly our unsaturated fats. So solid oils are going to be saturated fats. Liquid oils are going to be unsaturated fats. As far as the liquid oils go, um, I do have some other studies here that I, I was prepared to talk about. But again, we are kind of running along and I'm <laughs> trying, to, trying to cut these down. Uh, so as far as, as amongst the liquid oils, there's really not a big difference between any of them. I think that um, what the evidence clearly shows is that canola oil may very well be the healthiest oil you can consume, uh, the next one being olive oil. However, the differences are minute, right? So if I was to, to make a recommendation to people today would be Try to replace those solid fats with the liquid oils as often as you can, right? Not saying that you can't have those um, butter and ghee and coconut oil and things, but let's just treat those um, 
you know, as, as treats. So maybe you want to make something on the weekend and you want to use butter to cook it in, or you're going to add butter to your pancakes or something like that. Treat it that way. And the rest of the time we're using these liquid oils. Um, and which one to use, you know, like I said in the beginning, I think for me, it really comes down to taste. I don't think there's a, a, a huge difference in the health impacts. All of them, all of them show positive health outcomes. Okay. Okay. And then this, okay. the same thing goes for the saturated fats. So there is a threshold of effect when we're consuming these things. The butter, the ghee, the coconut oil, olive oil, we see a positive effect up to a certain threshold. And then beyond that, we start to see um, uh, detriments to our health. And the same thing for the liquid oils. You can definitely consume too much of that stuff. And um, any recommendation that you look at, we're talking about the recommendation of consuming most of these things in the realm of two tablespoons a day. Right, right, right. Those, right. those are what the recommendations are. So, um, you know, uh, olive oil, we have seen um, olive oil and canola oil. We have seen lots and lots of studies that kind of like you could consume up to 30 percent of your of your daily intake from those foods. And we see health benefits all the way up in those things. So, so question. So, yeah. um, solid fats, liquid fats, which, which of those, is there, is there a higher, can we say linoleic acid is higher in solids as opposed to liquids? Well, the linoleic acid content is going to be in the, um, primarily in the liquid oils. Uh, it will be in very, very trace amounts in the solid oils because the linoleic acid is really predominantly coming from plant sources. Okay. 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 Um, now you will find concentrations of it in your um, bloodstream and in your fat, in your adipose tissue. And the same thing goes for the animals that we're consuming. That's why it's in trace amounts uh, because we're getting the milk um, or the, or the, uh, the meat from, from those animals. And you're going to find it in trace amounts in those, but it's not to a high degree, but the, the, the higher amount would be in the, in the liquid oils. But again, like the, the overwhelming majority of evidence, uh, let me see, I'll pull one up here. Let me see if I can, I think it's this one. So let's enter into full screen here. So dietary fats in relation to total and cause specific mortality with a prospective cohort of 521,120. So 520,000 individuals with 16 years of follow-up. Those other studies, we had 25 people and they were like 16 weeks long. Right. This is 16 years of follow-up, 520,000 individuals. Uh, these people are aged 50 to 71, so they're not college-aged males. Um, and 16 years of follow-up. Uh, overall, there's 130,000 deaths in these 521,000 people, with 7.3 million years, million 7.3 million person years of follow-up. And what these, uh, um, the conclusion coming from all of this, so what the data says is replacement of carbohydrates with saturated fatty acid resulted in a 29% increase in cause specific mortality. Okay. Replacement of carbohydrates with trans fatty acids was a 3% increase. We have a 2% decrease for monounsaturated fatty acids with a 9% increase from animal MUFAs and a 6% decrease for plant MUFAs. Okay, so monounsaturated fatty acids are found in both plant and animal sources, and we're seeing an increase from animal sources and a decrease from plant sources. And then replacing carbohydrates, and they are talking about um, refined carbohydrates. Okay. okay, and then we have a uh, a seven percent decrease for PUFAs for polyunsaturated fatty acids, and we have an eight percent decrease for marine, so fish and um, and shrimp and krill oil and stuff like that. Uh, an eight percent decrease for omega three PUFAs. Uh, where we go? We have a 
a 6% increase for alpha linoleic acid, which is not the linoleic acid we were talking about. This is a different thing. Mm -hmm. The linoleic acid that we were talking about, that omega-6 linoleic acid, we see a uh, 22, no, 12, I'm sorry, a 12% decrease in cause-specific mortality for linoleic acid. And we have a 10% increase for arachidonic acid. And uh, down here, the... Uh, the conclusion kind of coming from this isocaloric replacement of saturated fatty acids. So if we replace 100 calories of saturated fatty acid with these other things results in a, uh, uh, for linoleic acid results in an 8% decrease in cardiovascular disease, a 6% decrease in cancer, 8% respiratory disease, an 11% decrease in diabetes, and a 9% decrease in mortality. So replacing saturated fatty acid with linoleic acid resulted in less death, less cancer, less diabetes. And also replacement of refined carbohydrate with linoleic acid resulted in less death, less cancer, less diabetes. That's staggering. And this, that's a big trial. That's staggering. Vegetable oils, nuts, seeds. Wow. Wow. All right. So I hope that I hope that sunk into everybody. That's that's staggering. That's amazing. Yeah. We are probably going to have to have another podcast because this one really was just kind of dedicated to um, looking at at this one blog article. Um, but I really want to show people how to go about reading these things. Um, and kind of assessing what's being put into a blog article because uh, I know a, I get a lot of people telling me, um, you know, they'll, they'll tell me that something is bad for you or good for you, and then I'll ask them, what's the evidence for that? And they'll send me a blog article. And the first thing to note is that a blog article is an opinion piece. Right, right. The second thing to note is there's a lot of storytelling and there's a lot of poisoning of the well that happens in the beginning of these blog Right articles up at the front, right. To try to set you up um, with the preconceived notion before they even give you any evidence. And then a lot of times the evidence that they cite doesn't support their claims. Right. So uh, again, from uh, last time in our, uh, our sodium podcast, if somebody utilized these studies to support the claims that omega-6 fat contributes to general inflammation and health issues, and they use these studies, what can we say about their method of reading the study? Well, it's flawed from the very beginning. And it's yeah, not they probably based, didn't read it. <laughs> not well, yeah, and not based on data. So yeah, they probably didn't probably didn't read it. It's like saying, hey. Flying is more dangerous than driving a car. Yeah, they, they <laughs> no, it's they, not. <laughs> yeah, they 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 looked at the title, they read the abstract, and this this is continuation from last podcast. Um, they looked at the title, read the abstract, and um, the abstracts are not written in a manner that the average person can really understand what's being said in them, and so the the takeaway from that then is that, well, this, this supports my claim. And when you actually get into the numbers and we actually get into the details of this thing, we yeah. see that it just doesn't. Yeah. It just doesn't. Yeah. So my encouragement is, as we walk away from this, is that people read, read it, read it, read it. Try to understand what you're reading and uh, just don't go off of something that your neighbor just comes over and says, hey, you, know, you can't drink that. You can't eat that. Don't eat too much of that. But how do you know that? Oh, I just, I heard, you know, somebody down the street told me it's not going to work, you know? Yeah. What's, what's the evidence for that? Exactly. That's Where'd you read that? Ask. Is that true? Do you know? <laughs> That's good stuff, man. That's awesome. All right. Good, good lessons today. today. Good stuff. Yep. Uh, as always, I hope somebody took something away from this. Poppy Dwarl, I hope I blew your mind. You did. You did. And Absolutely. Yeah, we're going to come back, and we will see you guys next week. Lambie out. See you later.